Happy Easter. Happy, Happy Easter, Easter, Father. There's something about roads. There's something about roads. Today's gospel passage is commonly referred to as the road to Emmaus. I want to call it a 14-mile miracle. These two disciples, one of them named Cleophas, they were walking seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They were on a road. What is it about roads that capture our mind and our imagination? Think right now just about the power of the image of a road. We love to get on the road. There's poems written about roads and journeys and streets. Sometimes when we're cooped up in our house, we just want to get out on the road. Many of, us, many of you are doing that right now. You're cooped up in your house. You're tired of being locked up. So you get in your car and you just drive even just for the sake of driving. There's something about roads. As I was preparing for this homily, I just kept thinking about the road to Emmaus and leading some small groups on Zoom and uh, doing the work for the Alive program that we have. Uh, what all of a sudden hit me at one point was like, all the songs in our culture that have the word road in them. If you go to our uh, parish website, allsaintscatholic.net, and you go, we have, we have a, a, a section um, under the Alive with music. It has like nice, good, pious music. We've actually added a whole bunch of other songs that just have the, with the word road in them. Spend some time today thinking about all the songs you can think of with the word road in them. For those of you who know my antics, uh, I'll help you do that right now. So uh, I graduated high school in 1995, so let's start with, off with a little 1992 hit from Boys to Men. Although we've come to the end of the road, still I can't let go. It's unnatural. Or how about 1939 from The Wizard of Oz? Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow, 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 follow the yellow brick road. We're off to see the wizard. Or Willie Nelson, 1980. On the road again. I just can't wait to get on the road again. The life I love is making music with my friends. And I can't wait to get on the road again. 20 years earlier, Ray Charles hit the road, Jack. And don't you come back no more, no more, no more, no more. Hit the road, Jack. And don't you come back no more. 11 years later, John Denver. Country roads take me home to the place where I belong. West Virginia, mountain mama, take me home. Country roads. The year 2000. Rascal Flats. That God bless the broken road that led me straight to you. I'll give a shout out to uh, a saint in heaven, Vaughn Fisher. Five-year-old child who passed away in the midst of this corona pandemic. Uh, this little boy would sing from his bed, the couch, on a regular basis. A little Nas X and uh, featuring uh, Billy Ray Cyrus. Yeah, I'm gonna take my horse to the old town road. I'm gonna, yeah. The list is endless. Cheryl Crow, Ario Speedwagon, Bruce Springsteen, The Beatles, Steve Heat. What is it about roads that captivates our imagination? I think it's because we all know that on a road, amazing things really do happen. This 14-mile miracle on the road to Emmaus is about darkness turning to light. It's about doubt turning to hope. So let's go back and look at this story real quick. These two disciples, they have turned their back on Jerusalem on the third day. And these are two individuals that actually went and saw the tomb that morning. If you read the text, these two, these two disciples actually went 
to the tomb that morning. They saw the empty tomb and they're walking away from Jerusalem and they actually have lost hope. The text clearly says, we had hoped. We had hope because they had lost hope. They were returning to some town that actually isn't even on a map today. Archaeologists don't actually know where Emmaus actually was. They're going to some town, they're going back, and they're leaving, and they're putting their back to Jerusalem. And in the midst of losing hope, what happens? Hope joins them. Hope incarnate. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, who is hope itself, starts walking with them. They're returning to their old way. They're returning to their old habits. They're returning to their old way of life. And Jesus is like, nah. Don't leave early. Don't leave early. Don't give up. Persevere. I mean, it, it, it's really interesting if you look at their leaving on the third day. Like, they would have known that he said again and again and again on the third day. I will rise. They've seen him, but they've lost hope. So what about you and I? How often do we lose hope? How often do we lose our focus? How often do we give up? We don't persevere. We don't stay on the road. And yet then hope appears. How often do people leave early? For those of you who are parishioners here at All Saints, we, we know that we don't leave Mass early. You might miss my third homily. But right now, I want you to ask you a question in your life. Like, have you left early? Not Mass. Have you left something in your life early? And what has that done to you? To your relationships, to your life? So Jesus, hope itself, shows up on the scene when they have no hope. But he does it in this really kind of interesting way, right? When we talk about Jesus, when we talk about God, the Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which Jesus is the second person of, we often use words like all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipotent, omniscient, awesome, glorious. A word we often don't use to describe the second person of the whole, most holy trinity, which I want to propose today, is sneaky. <laughs> we have a very sneaky God who just like shows up out of nowhere, unannounced, in the dark, disguised, in unknown or unheard of places, and brings hope and joy in extraordinary ways. I mean, let's look at the whole life of Jesus. Where is Jesus born? Bethlehem. It's Easter. We're talking about Christmas. Where, what is Bethlehem? Nothing. Bethlehem was an unknown, unimportant town. Yes, King David came from there. But if you are the Son of God, if you are the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, if you are here to save the whole entire world, uh, you should have been born in Rome or in Jerusalem, or in some major metropolitan area, there, there should have been uh, some big drama going on. But instead, he's born in Bethlehem, and there's a bunch of shepherds there. He sneaks in, and then what? And then he sneaks out. He sneaks down to Egypt, lives there, then comes back up to Nazareth, and remains absolutely silent and hidden for 30 years. Then all of a sudden he appears and he starts working miracles, but what does he do? Every time he works a miracle, he pulls the person aside and says, don't tell anyone. I don't want anybody to know. Theologically, we refer to this as the messianic secret. Jesus doesn't want people to know who he is. He's sneaky. So then what happens? Well, my Sunday homily on Easter, we talked about how Jesus sneaks out of the tomb. Jesus' resurrection takes place without the guards knowing, without the stone being rolled back. Jesus sneaks out of the tomb. Then what does he do? He starts sneaking up on people. The first is Mary Magdalene on Easter Sunday morning. Mary Magdalene's at the tomb weeping after Peter and John leave. Jesus appears, but she doesn't recognize him. 
she sneak, he sneaks up on her. Then he sneaks up on these two disciples uh, who have lost hope. Then he's going to sneak into the room with the 12 apostles that night, with the 11 apostles that night. He's going to sneak in the next week when Thomas is there. We have a very sneaky God. What does this all mean? You better watch out because he's probably sneaking up, you on, you, sneaking up on you right now. I'm serious. Right when we think that God is not with us, he's going to sneak up on us. And of course, we know that God is always with us. But it's actually really powerful for us to know that when we lose hope, when we're struggling, when we feel alone, when we feel abandoned, Jesus is going to make himself known. Just as he snuck up on Mary, just as he snuck up on these two apostles, just as he snuck up his whole entire life. And if we really look at our lives, I mean, we have to look back in retrospect to actually often realize that God was even there. You pray for blessings, and what? God sneaks up and sends those blessings often through difficulty and trial. You pray for peace, and God sends you peace, what? Through chaos. You pray for patience, and God gives you a teenager. Patience, dressed up like a teenager. You pray for generosity, and God sneaks up by giving you another child in your life. You pray for understanding, and God gives you the hardest struggle you've ever had in your life. God continually sneaks up in our lives, in unknown ways, in confusing ways. And we don't see it until the return trip. Because you see, the journey that we talk about today is a miracle of 14 miles. These two disciples in one day walked 14 miles. They walked seven of them with Jesus and they walked seven of them back. They walked seven of them doubting and confused and wondering, but they walked seven of them full of hope with their back on Emmaus and their face towards Jerusalem. These two disciples were transformed by a sneaky God who snuck up on him and gave him hope. So what happened at the turnabout? What happened when they turned around? Why did they turn around? Well, after Jesus was preaching some scripture to him, which is really kind of interesting, these two disciples actually, at the beginning, because they don't recognize who it is, they're actually preaching to Jesus. They're telling Jesus what he did. They're telling the gospel to him. It's like telling the author about a book that he himself wrote. Jesus then starts unpacking it from the Old Testament. Then they're like, stay with us, Lord. Well, they don't say Lord, stay with us. They don't recognize it's the Lord yet. They go into the house, and what does Jesus do? Seven miles out... He takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to him. This is key. What does he do? He takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to him. And then what happens? They recognize him in the breaking of the bread. Follow the gesture again. He takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to him. What do they recognize? The wounds in his hands. He breaks it and gives it to them. And they recognize him. They recognize him, a God who snuck up on death who snuck up on death on the cross and brought life, who snuck up on the whole world in blood, in flogging, in scourging, in being spit upon, in being nailed, in being crucified, who snuck up on death, who snuck up on the grave and brought life. That's our God. And in the midst of that suffering, 
These two disciples recognize that God disguises glory and blessing and grace and peace. He disguises it in difficulty, in trial, in suffering, in chaos, in isolation, and even in death. This 14-mile miracle, my brothers and sisters, is what God wants to do for you and for me. And yet we need to open our eyes and we have to actually allow ourselves to be taken by God and often to be broken and to be given away. It's when we allow ourselves to be entrusted by God, to be held by God, and yes, to be broken and to be given away that we recognize him. That's why the Mass is so important. Because at every single Mass, Jesus, again, in the person of the priest, bread is taken, it's blessed, it's broken, and it's given. And the Mass is to transform us so that we are able to live that. We are all on an Emmaus journey right now. And we are called to recognize the Lord Jesus. But we are then called to turn back to Jerusalem and to be people of hope. And people who share the message about a pretty sneaky God. God is sneaking up on you right now. He is with you right now. He loves you right now. Whatever struggle or toil or difficulty, know that God is in that. And that in you being broken, in you being given, Christ will be recognized. May this 14-mile miracle allow us to turn around and to set our eyes on the tomb, to set our eyes on Jerusalem, to set our eyes on the Lord. Will we be broken? Yes. But will we, will, will we be blessed? Yes. Through God's grace, may it be so, and through this 14-mile miracle, may our lives be transformed forever. Amen.